Well, The Timekeeper is a book that I wrote uh, basically because everybody I know is so infatuated with time. They're in such a hurry. Uh, they want to be more efficient. They want to live longer, but nobody's ever satisfied with time. And so I created kind of a modern day fable in which the first person to ever invent time uh, is, is explored. It's, it turns out to be a boy thousands of years ago who put a stick in the sand and began to measure the shadows of the sun. And Next thing you know, he's inventing a sundial, then he's inventing water clocks, and he's just infatuated with counting minutes and time, and he becomes so infatuated as a man that he kind of forgets to live his life. And ultimately, he's punished for trying to count time, and his punishment is that he has to live in a cave for eternity and listen to all the voices of all the people who come after him complaining about time, the very thing that he invented. and. Uh, Basically, he's there until he seems to learn his lesson about what the true meaning of time is, in which point he's given the opportunity to return to Earth with an hourglass, looking very much like Father Time, the famous figure that we know. And his charge is to find one very young person and one very old person and see if he can teach them what they don't understand about time. And if he can, and if he succeeds, then he is free from this purgatory and he sort of can fulfill his destiny and he takes this hourglass and at one point he actually stops the entire world and freezes it in a single moment which he plucks a grain of sand out of the hourglass and holds it and that's it in his hand and he attempts to teach these two what they don't know and we find out if he's learned his lesson or not. Well, I suppose the catalyst for writing this book was uh, number one just getting older myself and realizing you know looking back on how I've lived my life and how many years I think I have left. But at the same time that this was all happening, my, my parents both fell uh, seriously ill. Uh, they both suffered strokes, ironically, and my mother, one that was debilitating enough that she, she can't speak anymore, and she's a wheelchair bound and unable to talk. And then my father, not long after her, and one that robbed him of his movement on his uh, left side and so he also was wheelchair bound and they were very vibrant creative people who had some very uh, great plans for the latter years, the last years of their lives and just like that all those plans were gone and this isn't how they envisioned spending their time and so it made me acutely aware of you know that old expression man plans and God laughs and uh, so I began to think more and more about how we value our time, how we spend it, how we measure it, how we think, well, if we're going to get 80 years, we'll get everything in. But my parents have gotten 80 years, but it's not the way that they thought it was going to go. And uh, so I think all that kind of created the atmosphere for me to focus on this particular subject at this particular time. The older character who Father Time has to talk to He's one of the richest men in the world, but he has a disease, and he decides he can't imagine the world without him in it uh, because he's so important. And so he's going to freeze himself cryonically and then come back in a couple hundred years and live all life over again. It just so happens that in the state where I live, Michigan, in the United States, that is the center of cryonics and the, the, the headquarters of the guy who sort of really invented it uh, is only about 30 minutes from my house. And so uh, I called them up and I, you know, they knew who I was and I said, listen, I'm doing this, this book about time and I'd like to sort of find out how this all works. And they were kind enough to sort of bring me in and walk me through everything. And they literally showed me the, uh, the slab where the body is first laid down and covered in ice and then injected with a, uh, almost an antifreeze uh, that, that goes through the bloodstream that keeps everything from coagulating and icing up and, and you, know, uh, uh, you know, just like antifreeze does. And then the body is placed into a, uh, a box where its temperature is slowly continually brought down, continually brought down for about five days and then in a sleeping bag. And then it's taken out and put into a, a big, huge uh, cylinder, which is probably about the size of the room that we're in here now. Six people per cylinder hung upside down and they're encased in liquid nitrogen uh, which of course is very dangerous to work with and they had you know I saw all the liquid nitrogen and all the cans and everything and then they they basically they remain inside these these giant cylinders which are in a big huge warehouse which you can walk around the cylinders and you can sit in a couch like this 
uh, as people sometimes do uh, for a, a graveyard visit, so to speak, only they're coming and seeing their, their loved one is inside a, a cylinder and they actually have little boxes that have slots that each one is uh, affiliated with a cylinder. So there's one and two and three and four and five and six and they put flowers or wreaths or whatever you would leave inside the slot because you can't put it on a cylinder, obviously. And you just see these sort of memorial boxes with flowers and you realize people are visiting their loved ones inside these cylinders, but it's quite clinical. It's very science fiction-y, very supernatural, sort of eerie light and uh, a weird feeling to the whole thing. I try not to make any judgments on it and I say so in the book. If people choose to want to go that route, you know, by all means, that's their prerogative. Uh, the way that I write about it in the book is actually illegal, uh, but that's part of the story that this guy is so rich that he wants to break the rules. You're not allowed to freeze yourself until after you have been legally declared dead in the United States. He wants to cheat the system and wants to actually freeze himself before he dies to have a better chance of, uh, of, of, of uh, coming back. And so, um, you know, that's his plan. But of course, you have to read the book to find out what, what happens. I think my particular interpretation of time is a philosophy that would hold even if I wasn't a religious person or faithful person, because I believe that uh, there is a reason that our days are limited, as I say in the book. And uh, as Father Time says to the old man, there is a reason in, in the book he says, you know, there's a reason God limits your days, but it's true even if you don't believe it's God. And he asks, well, what's the reason? And the answer Father Time gives him is to make each day precious. And when you think about it, it is an amazing, tragic, yet beautiful arithmetic of life that because we don't live forever, what we choose to do with each day is what ultimately constructs and shapes the life that we lead. If we did live forever, the equation would be totally different. Nothing would matter. Nothing would really matter. Because you live forever, you can do anything you want along the timeline. So you want to be a good man for a million years and you want to be a bad man for a million years. What difference does it make? You can try them both out. It's like taking clothes off the rack. I'll be good, I'll be bad, I'll be a priest, I'll be a thief. Or but because you only have so much time on earth and you never know if your time's going to run out today or tomorrow or a hundred years, then the choice that you make on that given day and the choice you make tomorrow and the choice you make the next day adds up to your legacy. And so you may get many years. You get a hundred years and really not do anything. Not touch anybody, not help anybody, not love anybody. But you just got your hundred years. Okay, so what? It's digits. Or you may only live 20 years, but yet, you know, you're one of those kids who gets a childhood disease and just ends up influencing all kinds of people and everybody's lives are changed who comes in contact with you. And you've only had 20 and yet you've had a profound effect. And I think that that's true whether you believe in God or otherwise, that equation of the limit to life, the mortality that we face, forces us to view time as more than just something to be measured. It, it's a, a ticking clock on your choices, not just a ticking clock on your ticker, you know. And uh, if you look at life that way, then I think you would probably be more prone to make choices that are more everlasting than just, gee, how much money am I going to make tomorrow, or what accomplishment am I going to rack up here, or, or you know, how drunk am I going to get this evening? You know, that's just my view. My vault of wasted time is quite large. Um, before I had uh, my experience with my old professor, uh, Maury Schwartz, which turned into the book Tuesdays with Maury, and I was 37 years old at the time that I re-encountered him, I would say from age about 23 to 37, I basically did uh, nothing but work. Uh, you know, 100 hours a week was, was not an exaggeration. I even moved three days a week. I lived in another city just so that I could do some television work. And I gave away all kinds of time that I could have been spending uh, developing relationships, 
uh, uh, tending to my friendships, uh, being a better person in my community. Um, I mean, you name it, you know, anything other than accomplishments, which I was very good at, and I piled those up pretty well. Uh, besides that, I wasn't a very complete human being at all. Um, it probably cost me the ability to have a family, you know, children of my own, uh, because by the time I got married, uh, my wife and I were both, uh, she was 39, I was 37, you know, you're, you're, the odds were against us and they proved to be against us. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of children in my life, uh, nieces and nephews, and some orphans that we work with in Haiti, uh, but it's not the same necessarily as having your own. And I think I paid a price for that. So there, yeah, there's, there's many, uh, many, 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 many moments that I wish that I could have given back some of my work time in exchange for um, human being time. But the good news is that uh, after age 37 and after Tuesdays with Maury, I began to start to look at life through that prism a little bit better. Not perfectly, and I'm still not, you know, even as I'm sitting here with you. Um, I mean, I'm working to some degree right now, so, uh, but I think that that's fine, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying people should just go live in a tree and hum all day, I, I, that's, not, that's not much of a life either. But the balance of uh, work versus personal relationships and just living in the moment, I, I, I was way off on for many years, and uh, you know, I hope to get if uh, the fates are kind, I hope to get you know many more years that I can try to balance that out.